Right, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about design patterns for an Internet of Things, for, in, for the Internet of Things. And um, <clears throat> the, the point is that uh, I've been working on what you might call reference architecture for Internet of Things for a couple of years now, and it's been um, it's, it's not converged. There isn't really a reference architecture for the Internet of Things. Different people are doing different things. So I've decided to sort of break that down and look at the individual design patterns. And um, it's, it seems to make sense. What a design pattern is in, in software and in really, uh, it's a reusable solution to a, uh, a problem or a, a, a circumstance that you encounter frequently. So software design patterns have become really popular in the last couple of decades with uh, with the rise of open source and agile programming. And we're talking here about system design patterns, that what I'm seeing is in Internet of Things, we are converging on a set of system level design patterns that define how things, how things interact with each other and how things um, communicate. So then an architecture, a reference architecture, can be built back up out of a, a set of design patterns that are put together to solve a particular problem in a, in a particular way for a use case. And the use cases that, uh, that I'm kind of focused on are the usual ones you see in smart homes and smart buildings and cities and wearables, assisted living vehicles, factory automation, asset tracking. I think these all have a number of things in common, but each use case has some difference that requires some different solution about connectivity, about power management, about bandwidth, about how applications discover things. So that's really what we're going to look at is, is sort of what are the high-level design patterns. And as the Internet of Things was, uh, was being figured out, there were a, a few, there were a few different ways that people see it. <coughs> so I'm going to look at these high-level patterns. The first one is kind of a little tongue-in-cheek, but things get smarter and smarter until they can start bossing each other around. In other words, that the Moore's Law is creating a richer and richer embedded software. So basically, uh, things get smart enough so that an application or something that you want to have happen can actually run on one of the things. If thermostats and light bulbs can find their own light switches, there's really, there's really enough uh, this is going to continue, and, and uh, devices will get more and more uh, sophisticated and be able to do more and more. But that's not, really, that's not really a full description either, because then there are people who are saying, well, look, there's billions of sensors. It's a big data problem. There's billions of sensors. And if we can put all this data together, then we can you know, solve some of the big problems and, and come up with some big answers or optimize our business better or, or do whatever we want to do. But, that's sort of like taking all these sensors together. And then you know, we come down to <clears throat> what, what it really is. It's not necessarily, this isn't the only thing that happens, but, but this happens a lot. This exists in the home today. Your phone, your smart TV can interact with other devices. The big data view, it, it happens too. It's being done in, in cities and agricultural data and what have you. But I um, really want to look at this more complex picture here where we have people and things and software interacting in, in some fairly well-defined ways. So first of all, people really have limited attention spans. So what we're trying to do is create things that are automated. So we want the software to interact with things in an autonomic way. We want to come up with software that, that's that uh, uh, can execute rules and execute logic that doesn't require our attention to, uh, to interact. So we have an autonomic feedback loop that we want to establish between things and software. But we also want people to be in charge and, and people to be in control. So we have a, a cybernetic feedback loop that, that's the man-machine interface, if you will. But we really want to unburden that. We don't want it. Uh, we don't want the internet and other things to be, you know. Already we, we check our phone. You know, everyone's checking our phone. But what if there are like a uh, hundred things in your periphery that you care about? Are you going to be checking all those things all the time? I really want to go back the other way, and uh, automate a lot of that interaction. We don't really know how to do that yet. But this is sort of like a, a meta design pattern for systems, the Internet of Things. Right. 
So, and then there are some abstract design patterns. So what is, what, is, what is really happening with the Internet of Things? You have devices, you have networks, you have software. But really what's happening, and here's the big, what I think is the big deal with the Internet of Things, is that Moore's Law has been chunking along at a really good rate, doubling capability every 18 to 24 months. It's pretty infallible, but uh, that's still a trajectory. What's happening with the Internet of Things is now Instead of depending on Moore's law to give us more transistors and higher clock speeds and, and, and that on the devices, we're now connecting software external to the device. And what you can do, the, the software you can connect to a device is practically unlimited. It can run in a gateway or a cloud server or a PC or on your phone or in all of those places at once. And that really is disrupting the trend of more and more connected intelligence. So yes, devices are getting smarter and smarter, but this ability to connect more intelligence than you could ever put inside the device, I think, is, is really one of the main patterns and one of the main value drivers for the Internet of Things. What's happening is things are being virtualized. So you have a physical thing, you have a sensor or an actuator, and a virtual representation of that is getting created for software. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, you can hook something up to software and wiggle the bits and make it do stuff. But it's interesting to think about this being a virtual representation. Because what happens then is that opens the, the door for many-to-many -many, uh, interactions. So instead of just one thing having its interface and its software that controls it, so something that you buy on Kickstarter that has a, a cloud service that's dedicated for the device and protocols that use kind of standard web protocols, but they use them in a way that's special for the way that software interacts with the device. That's the, the, the vertical model, what we used to call silos. But having, uh, having consistent abstractions gives us the ability to connect multiple different sensors to multiple different application programs because they all understand the same abstractions. And that's done through data models, basically. There are communication protocols and what have you, but <clears throat> as I'll show, the data model is really what the application needs in order to understand the device or the sensor. Uh, given a data model that, that uh, is consistent and, and um, rich enough and useful enough, you can adapt the system to different protocols relatively easy. It's the data model that's really important for interoperability that allow multiple applications to be able to operate in a consistent way with a given sensor or endpoint. So what, what the data model also is, is a place for middleware. And so this is kind of leads into the next part of the, the, next part of the uh, design pattern discussion. Um, any questions or any, any, uh, anyone want to make any comments at this point? Express. Yes. Express. Sorry. Ex Express. No uh, JS Express. Yes, yes. Oh, I see. Middleware. Yes, middleware. Well, there's, the middleware does a lot, um, as it turns out. So what, what I want to do now is get into a little bit about what, what IoT middleware does, um, the design patterns around network topology, and specifically discovery and interaction between applications and devices. So there are a lot of different ways that you know, we see devices interacting, Internet of Things. Um, <clears throat> we hear a lot of, you see a lot about the peer-to-peer -peer interaction where, where there's some device that has an embedded application like the, the Nest thermostat device or, or some other control panel that might be connecting to a, a less sophisticated, simpler device to, to set up a control loop. And um, the, the peer to peer pattern is, is, is um, pretty common and useful, but it's also really limited. It's, it's based on you know, only what you can pre program devices to do. So, unless you have a smartphone, and, and unless a smartphone or something that can run apps is one of those devices, it, it's limited to a small set of patterns. So, middleware, or here, here I'm calling it a service. Um, one example is Lightweight M to M. OMA Lightweight M to M is a standard middleware for Internet of Things that uh, we'll, I'll uh, mention a little bit more later. 
But basically, um, it provides a central point of control. So instead of devices having to find each other and be listening when the broadcast of who I am happens, a sensor can come online and register with the middleware, and another device uh, that wants to interact with it can discover it and interact with it on a peer-to-peer -peer basis that this middleware might just provide a way for sensors to register and discover. But it also provides a way for uh, uh, web applications to interact with the devices through a proxy. And this is, this is important because a lot of these devices are on constrained networks. They're battery powered. They sleep between doing important things. They don't really sit around waiting to hear what, you know, what kind of command is coming in next. So the, the proxy basically allows the web application or, or other local application software to interact with the device without having to turn the device on to interact with it necessarily. So the proxy will be a, will read the last cached value. If, it, if the application wants to actuate the device, the, the middleware can cache that value, and next time the device wakes up, it can send the commands. So it's, it's basically a way, and, and many, many applications might want to interact with the device, and each time some application wants to, say, read the value, that's going to consume some energy from the device's battery and, and uh, some network bandwidth you might be paying for by the bit. Yes? So your service, uh, I think that's lightweight machine to machine, is that right? That's correct. That's what it stands for. Is that at the edge or is it at your, uh, at your uh, enterprise? So is that, that service can be in both places. It can be at the edge, and it's really an important pattern to locate that service at the edge, because then you don't require broadband connectivity to be able to actu actuate and sense. So in a smart home, um, if, you're, if you don't want to depend on your uh, connection to some web service to turn your lights on, you need something that's going to interact locally. So yes, this lightweight M2M can operate locally in a gateway or in a, a local hub or something like that, or, uh, or in a cloud service, or, or as an enterprise component in the stack. Okay. And uh, we'll go through a, just a few examples of how this works. Uh, the example here is based on the pattern for lightweight M2M. We have a couple of um, IP protocol connected devices, internet protocol. We have a Bluetooth low energy device that doesn't connect via IP, but it can connect to a proxy. It can connect to a smartphone or a set top uh, box or something like that that has both Bluetooth radio and a, a net, an IP network connection to get on the IP network. Device server is a layer of software. I'm showing it here in the cloud, but there could be local instance <coughs> or cloud instance. And soft endpoints are the representation of what's on the device that the server maintains for applications to interact with. And you see a uh, web browser or a smartphone app will interact with the web app. So the web app might be something that's doing this automation. It's, it's receiving notifications from sensors and it's updating actuators and it's doing things that, um, that the user doesn't necessarily have to be concerned with, but when something unusual happens, it can create notifications that it sends over to the the browser. Yes. Does the data modeling happen at the server level? Or do you have that? <coughs> That's a good question. We'll uh, kind of look at that a little bit more a little uh, a little later. The the data model is something that the server needs to um, communicate between the app and the devices. But the server itself doesn't really need to be involved in interpreting any of the data models. So the, the architecture that uh, that I've been, uh, or the design pattern rather, that I've been focusing on is one where the device server can be agnostic of the application, but still cache the the metadata in the data model as well as the as well as the data. So what happens is um, in this in this model in this design pattern. The devices themselves register, um, they register links with the device server. And the link is basically tells the device server what resources are on the device and how to interact with them. It's, it's sort of a, like a web link. And in fact, the device itself is, is really acting as a server in this case, or able to act as a server. And the device server is able to act as a client to the device. When the device registers, it's acting as a client to the server, though, and it's pushing up some links. Yes? What is, what is the way the device 
find out about the device or the <laughs> So there are a few ways of doing that also, and that's where you go back to uh, being able to use well-known mechanisms like multicast DNS. Or if you have a multicast network, there are some constrained network protocols in IETF co-op that allow you to, uh, to do broadcast queries and retrieve resources from all the devices in the network. And using that, a, a device can do a query and identify a device server that has the, what we call the resource directory function. And if it discovers a resource directory function, it knows that it can register, it has a place to register. But usually there's device management that's a little more complex and there's some way that the device obtains a pointer to the server that it's supposed to interact with. Do, do you also have redundancy on the device server? They may be. There may be um, a device may be associated with multiple servers. So if one of them is not available, the other one will be able to provide the service. And using REST APIs, it's uh, relatively easy to arrange conflict-free interaction. So devices register the links with the server, then the server creates a proxy location that allows applications to discover <coughs> how to interact with the device through the server. Once that happens, the, basically the server is a proxy for operations. So a web app will do, a, say, a get to a resource on the device. The server will then, if, if, if the cache content can't be returned directly, if it's not cached, will go and do a get up from the device, return the content from the device, then update the cache and, and supply it to the web app. And then if another, another, app, uh, another application or that application makes another request within the, uh, the lifetime of data in the cache, it can be supplied directly from the server, from the device server and won't have to um, and won't have to uh, interrupt the device again. Also with this pattern, the device is able to asynchronously notify things that are happening. So the device can wake up and say, ah, oh, the temperature has changed since the last time I sent a measurement. I'm going to send a new measurement and, and, and update. <clears throat> it just needs to send that to the server one time. And after that, all of the, uh, all of the web apps will have uh, access to it. In, this, in most cases, the server, device server can also forward the notification asynchronously. So as shown here, the device would, would update the value on the server, and the server would act like a, a broker. It would have a number of web apps that were subscribed or, or listening, and it would be able to send them the new value to update all of those web apps asynchronously. So you could have a situation here where through the server, server middleware, through the device server, You've set up from your web app to get notified every time something on the device changes through the, through the device server. <coughs> and there are hooks in, in uh, protocols I'll uh, touch on a little bit later that allow that to happen while using uh, RESTful APIs. I love this model. This is, I think this is the sort of thing we need for the Internet of Things. Um, question on the device. Value of an IP uh, addressable device versus not IP. So, IP addressable devices basically give us a common way to, to route packets around things. And a lot of these protocols are just built to connect to the, the socket model that a layer three um, or layer four um, um, IP stack provides. So it's a point of commonality that allows this to, to work without gateways and proxies. But when you have in the case here of a BLE device, it would just have its own Bluetooth connection to an IP device and then that IP device. Or, you know, we could put a proxy for Bluetooth in the device server as well. But, the, you know, the, the practicality is having to do with radio range and where that's located. <clears throat> oh, BLE sent Bluetooth? Sorry. BLE. Yes, Bluetooth low energy. And Bluetooth will have an IP uh, capability in, in a maybe the standard in a year or, or so, but they're working on it. And at that point, things will be a little easier to connect. I also had a same question. Thank you for asking that. The challenge actually becomes in enterprise deployments versus non-enterprise deployments. I think this model works great in smaller deployments where there's not much legacy, and you can build your IP-centric, web-centric model. Clearly, when you go into legacy environments, um, the access to the proxy, maybe Johnson Controls or Honeywell, 
all bets are off. Um, so that adaptation layer becomes somewhat custom, or you may not even have the access to the devices attached to that. So that's one of the challenges we are facing. Uh, in an all IP world, it is far easier with this model. Uh, so there, there are two ways that people are approaching that right now. One is to do the conversion at a higher level and treat this model as something that's sort of for new deployments. Another way is to use this as a gateway between an existing, uh, say, in, in, um, um, in smart buildings, it's BACnet, right? So you have BACnet. BACnet can plug into this, and this can be a proxy for BACnet to, to be IP enabled as well. That's a little more work because you have to understand the semantics of BACnet devices, but ultimately you have to do that at some point anyway because you're going to connect your application. So we're all faced with this problem of how to integrate the, the legacy, definitely. Okay. So uh, another view of this, uh, middleware services, what, what basically, um, <clears throat> and it sort of um, talks to the enterprise deployment a little bit, that uh, devices may not be reachable and uh, the, the application software may be running places that aren't internet reachable. But by putting our resource directories and servers and device servers and brokers in where they're reachable, we can create an internet connected system that has endpoints that are safely behind firewalls and uh, cloud services that are, that are reachable. <coughs> So the idea is that um, you could use the uh, resource directory or catalog to discover resources as an application, you know, maybe you're measuring temperature, you're looking at traffic patterns or parking spaces or whatever you're looking at. Then you would use a REST API to interact with some of those static resources and, and retrieve descriptors and what have you. And then if there was a, a, a continuous data to be transmitted, you could, you could then use the publish subscribe uh, through a broker to, uh, to hook up to those data streams. So all three of those different places in the life cycle of an application might be useful. And this just shows um, another view of that. For example, what, what would be possible is to, to put your REST API in the gateways have resource directory in order to discover resources in other gateways and then use a, a pub sub broker to send data between gateways. So the application and the device would each see REST APIs and wouldn't know that they're used a double proxy situation as an example of a, of, a, of a higher level design pattern that can be built out of these lower level elements. Okay, so um, now we really get to the point where a lot of the design that's been done already on the, for the internet and the web is actually really good design and it, it, it has a lot of the qualities we're looking for in IoT already. So I wanted to talk about how we can reuse a lot of the design patterns that we're using in the internet to achieve scalability, uh, low barrier to entry for developers, uh, <clears throat> software and uh, resource reusability. So really what, what the internet has, and I think one of the big architectural innovations of the internet is this layered architecture and narrow waste model. And usually we're talking about IP protocols as being the narrow waste, where <clears throat> lots of different physical networks can you know, use different media, use copper wire, use air, use whatever, uh, to send signals, but they all basically end up looking like an IP protocol endpoint. So that creates a, a kind of a narrow waste where above you can have lots of different applications running and below you can have lots of different physical protocols as the, uh, as the use case requires. But um, also here around data models, we're looking at a second sort of narrow waste, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and that exists on the web today with URIs and the way hyperlinks are used for browsers to interact with servers. Um, so we don't actually have browsers with people that can look at the displayed text of a hyperlink and know what to do next. So what we need to do is figure out how to 
arrange hyperlinks to work with machines. If we want to use web design patterns, we want machine-to-machine -machine hyperlinks. Uh, so instead of me looking at a text displayed by a hyperlink and saying, yeah, I think I want to read that article, it's going to be more like some application is going to need to look at something in that hyperlink and say, is that something I want to, uh, is that a data source I want to connect to? Uh, so that hyperlink might say, is it measuring temperature? Is it measuring in Celsius? Does it measure? Is it measuring the feature of interest in the world that I care about? And this kind of thing. Uh, that would be the, uh, the point of interoperability around data models. And just that being the case, are we getting close to uh, looking for a semantic solution so we can And I, I think we I think we do, and, and there are really a few levels of that. First, we have content types that, that have some kind of semantics in them about how is this data encoded, and we kind of already know how to hook that up. Next, we have a, a protocol semantics. So an API might have some resources over here and then some other resource that's linked this way. So we need to kind of figure out that, and that's, that's a, another level of semantics. But what's really interesting is application-level semantics. Is it, how does an application recognize a temperature sensor and recognize its engineering units and recognize that it's something that it wants to interoperate with? That's, that's uh, definitely a semantic gap. And if you look at the people like uh, 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 Mike Amundsen, who was writing about APIs and that, they, they identified this semantic gap as being how do different applications understand the content of the APIs that they're interacting with? Yeah. We definitely have that. And what is almost the, the minimum hardware that, that's needed for some of these smart devices? Um, so for IP connected devices, using some of the standards we're talking about here, like CoAP and Lightweight M2M, um, 16K bytes of RAM and 64K bytes of ROM will, will do a very simple endpoint, like a thing that has a couple of sensors and a switch and an LED. And most of that is running you know, an IP stack. And uh, depending on the security you want and uh, what other kinds of features you want, resources, metadata actually takes quite a bit of space on these. right? There might be a couple K bytes just of the metadata that needs to be stored to describe the sensor. But yeah, down in the range of 16 k bytes. Dual sensors. Um, looking at this uh, architecture, um, are they aware of the data models that they are sending over to the data server? So that's a really good question, and it's it's something that we're still trying to figure out the the design pattern. How much of the data model is stored in the device? And how much is, um, you've seen this thing from Google, they call it the physical web. So the device just sends out a beacon with the URI and you have to go take that URI and you know, go reference it on the web to find out what it is. So the device itself there doesn't have to have any metadata. That's all referenced over the web. We have here uh, in, in CoAP and Lightweight M2M a small set of data, metadata that represents the sensor so that when it registers itself with the server, the device server uh, doesn't have to go reference anything on the web. It has everything it needs to expose to applications. But then if you think about what applications are going to do next, they're going to want to identify where is the sensor located, um, who owns it, do I have access control permission, do I have access permission to it, uh, is it measuring the thing I really care about measuring? Because all, I know it's a sensor and it's already told me that, but what's it measuring? What feature of interest is it measuring? And, and so there's more in metadata that needs to be then added after the sensor is installed and exposed through the, through the device server. So the sensor doesn't even know everything a priori. It, it, a lot of it is context dependent. All right. So another thing we have that's common in web architectures is this idea of REST API. And there's really a lot, a lot more to that than you know, the, the first glance might tell you. At first, there's a client-server design pattern assumed that with the REST API, there's someone making a request and someone supplying a request. So when we talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, that's just a duplexed client-server connection usually in, in, the, in the real world. It's resource-oriented, and that 
means that things are pointed to with URIs and that uh, things at endpoints are relatively stable. Um, the stability of endpoints used to be pretty strongly kind of recommended for, uh, for web, web apps, but nowadays we're, we're getting better at using hypermedia, so, uh, but we still need some sort of recess ori resource orientation even, even if resources can come and go. Um, CRUD semantics meaning create, um, read, update, and delete. That's sort of, you know, get, put, post, delete. Uh, meaning that there are a few other options like head and um, uh, um, patch that can be used to do special things, but pretty much create, read, update, and delete. And the last one is hypermedia driven, and that's the thing we were really talking about earlier, that, that web APIs, the reason the web scales so well is that browsers know how to interact with servers based on metadata. And, and even though there are all these protocols that extend what web servers can do, it, it all plays with the standard browser and the standard server API. And that's because of hypermedia. That's because of the metadata and the links that lead from one thing to another in, in web architectures. And the other concept that's kind of interesting and, and probably even more important for M to M is object encapsulation. Uh, and there are a couple of ways that, that means that there's, there's a web address that, or an address, a URI, that points to something, and within that there are some other attributes and some other values. <clears throat> and that may have a number of layers in it or a number of levels of encapsulation. And it's done through the path hierarchy, including resources in, in other resources, under them in the path, and it's also done through linking, transclusion. So resources can have other resources that they're linked to. The uh, big deal about linking is a number of things can all link to a shared resource, and you can't have that uh, property with inclusion and hierarchies. Question, question about linking. Uh, so if you have several sensors that somehow are uh, related to an experience, would that be a good example of linking? So like one sensor knows about another sensor, it knows about a third sensor? Or? It, it would be a good example of linking, but not necessarily encapsulation. It would be more like link, attribute linking. And so that's a good point, that link is, links are done for, uh, um, for like re relation entity linking, as well as for building up a set of attributes. Yeah, good point. So uh, in these systems, the client-server design pattern is, is, um, is used to talk to sensors. So here what we have, the server part is an actual sensor, and I've shown slash temperature as its uh, URI. The client does a get, and the, uh, the sensor returns temperature as a, as a representation of the value. So it's pretty much a REST API client-server. Um, CoAP, which is basically, I'm not going to go into it a whole lot, but CoAP is a protocol that works a lot like HTTP does. It, it provides a REST API, but it's binary mapped for constrained networks. So a CoAP packet can be as small as four bytes. Um, by the time you add even the IP stuff, you have a lot more than that. Um, it, but it's meant to talk on constrained networks, so, so things are binary mapped. But you have the same thing. You have get, put, post, and delete, and you have a a 404 return if the resource isn't there, and a 200 return if, if everything went okay. So it pretty much works just like a REST API. If you see it, this one says 200 okay. And of course the roles can be reversed since it sort of allows the, the sensor can be a client when it registers resources or talking to other sensors, and the sensor can be a server when it's supplying values. It can be a client when it's uh, 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 sending something out and actuating something, but it can be a server when it's being actuated. And that's, that's one important thing about M to M interfaces, is most of them are bi-directional this way. Yes? So in this diagram here, we're thinking of the client as your gateway? Yes, in this case the client is what was shown on the other uh, uh, diagram as the device server. So. Lightweight M to M likes to try to say uh, the device server is the server and the devices are the clients for the purposes of identifying things in its specification, but the actual roles are still duplexed. Sometimes the sensor acts as a client and sometimes it acts as a server, but under the lightweight M to M specification, the, the whole set of things that the middleware does is called server and the whole set of things that the endpoints do are called client. 
It's a little confusing, so, but uh, yeah. Okay. So, from a practical perspective, if some of these devices are installed and they are removed and they are working on say battery. So you don't want them on all the time. So that's right. If it's a server, pretty much has to be on, which means you don't have to that's that's another distinction, yes. So so the client role is characterized by being able to be disconnected. And in fact, in some of the specifications we're working on, we call it co-op pub sub or co-op MQ, where we try to do a pub sub pattern using co-op. The endpoints are strictly clients. They they initiate all all uh, transactions, and so it can be arranged so that so when the client sleeps and it's battery powered, it, it pretty much has to do that. I mean, one could imagine an e-paper actuator that woke up every minute to get new messages to show you, but the, those there are not very many cases. If you actuators also tend to need to be powered most of the time. Okay, so that's client server. Object encapsulation is basically uh, here's an example of uh, a lightweight M to M object, which is also the uh, the uh, IPSO object. And uh, the outer the outer box is the client. That's the endpoint that registers with the server. Within it, it has a number of objects. Each object being something in lightweight M to M that is uh, sort of a standalone thing, like a temperature sensor is a, is an object. Uh, a barometric pressure sensor is an object. Within the object, there are resources. So the temperature sensor might have one resource that says this is the current temperature. It might have another resource that returns a list of previous temperature values. It might have another resource which is the, the maximum uh, reading obtained from that sensor since the last time it was read. Or it might have another one that says the maximum minimum scale uh, that the, the, the temperature can read down to. So it'll have a number of resources that the client can use to help understand uh, either the capabilities or the state of the, the object. And again, these objects, each object, it's assumed would kind of map to a different sensor. So the, the, the client would be sort of a, uh, a microcontroller board that had maybe three sensors, and then these three objects within the client, uh, each one represents one of the sensors. So applications can go in and say, I, care, I only care about this sensor, I just want to measure temperature. Yeah, it's a it's a light fixture, but all I want is the room temperature. So it can just hook up to one of those objects and, and measure temperature. And here's another example of object encapsulation. This is an IPSO object that uh, I created as an ad hoc representation of the BLE heart sensor uh, profile. Just to show that BLE services and characteristics map really quite easily to REST APIs and objects and resources. So you see it has uh, it has a sensor value that represents the heart rate. It has some state, and it has a reset function and some other measurement functions like total energy and, and it, um, a list of R wave intervals, things like that. Um, the, the way IPSO objects work is uh, that the resources are reusable. So if I have a resource that means total energy, uh, that can be used in any object to represent the total energy as long as the units are correct. It's kilojoules or whatever. So um, the red, the ones in marked here in red are the resources I had to create in order to represent this, but I was able to reuse the ones in black. And as we go along building more objects, we're creating more resources that are generally useful and reusable to others. You'll be able to find objects that already do what you want to do and resources that <clears throat> that already do what you want to do, and it's this encapsulation that really enables that through a standard pattern. Mm, question? No. Okay, so uh, I think it's almost the last thing I want to talk about is data models, and what we're really talking about are these a few levels here. We talked about application semantics and and <clears throat> hypermedia, and that's kind of the interface. So from protocols and APIs, <coughs> we have sort of a hypermedia layer that has metadata and URL templates and things of that nature. And then above that, we have application semantics. And the data models are pretty much how that, that layer gets uh, traversed. So, so there are a, a number of components, too. There are device models and equipment models. So if I manufacture washing machines, I want to represent my washing machine virtual object 
with things that I care about for managing its life cycle, for adding value to customers, you know, whatever I want to do. So it's going to want to have water level measurements and temperature measurements and flow rate measurements and measurements whether the lint filter is plugged or whatever. That, I only want to do that once and, and be able to sort of take that template and use it for all my washing machines. And we're, we're even better off in the industry if all the washing machine manufacturers get together and create templates for a, what's a generic washing machine. So there might be 50% of the metadata is something that any application can go and run that washing machine. But if you're GE, or well, GE doesn't make washing machines anymore, they're going to make some real special ones. If you're Miel or whatever, then you might want to have some value added. Well, here's where you run our application. You get this optimization of your clothes get cleaner, or you use less water or energy, right? But that doesn't work on all washing machines. That only works with one. But you still want the basic function. So the device and equipment models are, are where manufacturers come at this problem. Uh, resource templates are where people who implement IoT endpoints and stuff want to automate the process of building APIs. So we like these resource templates. Metadata schemas are, are where we'd all like to get together and, and decide on just one way of making resource templates so we don't each you know, have to reinvent the wheel there. Uh, and then we have formats that we all like to use so that when we uh, connect one thing to another, we don't have to have a bunch of different translators. We like to use just a couple of different representations and data formats. But really where the interoperability comes up is around vocabularies and this other word, ontologies where we, we kind of need to agree on what is similar and what is different and, and what to call things and what, what things can do versus other things that can't do. And that's kind of where you get into the ontology that specifies more the relations between things and the vocabulary is uh, pretty much what you, what you call things. So a resource model basically is how, um, how essentially the way I see it is that <clears throat> software can interact with the REST API the REST APIs can be different and they can each represent specific cases, but software can still interact given a, a good uh, resource model, including metadata. And um, I added this real-time event notification as well just to remind that we'll see a little bit more in the protocols. REST APIs don't always mean static and uh, part of the resource model is how different ac actions can be bound to resources. No. Object models, not a whole lot different, but um, this is where encapsulation comes in. And uh, this is where the OMA lightweight M2M, IPSO objects, and a number of other specifications being written by people in these, these consortiums like IIC and OIC. They're really focusing a lot on defining how these object models work. Um, for web for web standards, there's core interfaces and core link format, which is the standard uh, metadata <coughs> semantic machine link format. And um, there's also a, a, a system called Hypercat, which is being built by a company that's in the UK that's creating a standard semantic catalog. Uh, basically, it's sort of between web linking and linked data. It's sort of, it sits there, it's not as, it doesn't do everything that linked data does, but it, but it does more than just standard web linking. And it's a catalog format, so it can be created as a standalone catalog. Um, hmm. Oops. Huh. We went the wrong way. OK, good. So uh, another thing about abs uh, object models, there's this idea of being able to create virtual objects. So if I have some, some endpoints now, things are just uh, virtualized, so I have temperature as just a, a resource representation. So I can now create a new object model that might pull representations from a number, a number of other objects and create this sort of composite virtual object that I just, I just made up. I, I might want to know the temperature in the room. I have like four sensors, but none of them are exactly where I want to sense, but I might be able to take those four sensors and put them together and, and make a, a model that shows what the temperature is where I want to, to sense, even though I don't have a sensor right there. There are other, other cases where that can be uh, uh, filtered versions, abstractions, averages. I might want to create a, a, a virtual object <coughs> to expose my power consumption to the power company. I have a contract with them that they give me a discount if they can see my usage, but I don't want them to know every time I turn on my toothbrush. So I can give them a, an abstracted model that's an average over time. and 
and uh, you know, maybe read only. It may be only available once a day, and, and we agree on when they're going to read it. So to make people feel good about their privacy, we can create models that, that hide a lot of information. Question. Question. So that's, that's possible, and um, I think, so the question was, can, can, a, can a given thing be controlled from more than one place? Like if I'm controlling temperature, can someone else I, I'll do that also? And the answer is yes, but there's also resource access control. So if, if you know, I and my wife both have permission to control the temperature in the room, we may actually both be trying to control it at the same time. And <laughs> you know, turning it up and down, that actually happens today, you know, if we don't talk, so. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Oops, okay. So, Today, using the framework that we were looking at earlier with the device server, it would be a thing that could be an application that runs on the device server. There could be a client application that observes a number of resources and then a, an endpoint, a virtual endpoint created that exposes the abstracted representations. But it could also be a device of its own that measures some things and provides a, an abstraction. The, the, the interesting thing is, um, I'll talk about it a little, a little more if I have time, but uh, applications don't really have to run in any one, they can run in the sensor, they can run in a gateway, they can run, you know, so, so this is just another application that's creating another layer of, of uh, device representation. Okay, so uh, basically I think I've covered a lot of this already, that, that basically in an object model there's this formed of metadata and um, currently that popular uh, to use semantic hyperlinks. So what we're looking at creating a model out of a number of links that form descriptors and, and uh, relations to other objects and things of that nature. That basically is the way that uh, <clears throat> software can discover resources by looking at uh, attributes in the metadata. So an attribute might be it measures temperature, it measures, it reports in Celsius. Software would, would then sort of say, for example, uh, here's an example at the end, get uh, well-known core, which is a storage location for metadata, interface equals sensor. So that, queer, that, that get containing the, the, the query would return all of the object's uh, resources that have an interface type of sensor. So we just wanted to say, I want to look at all the sensors, um, just as an example of how that works. And interoperability happens basically at this level when different applications can all use common concepts and common design patterns and common vocabularies to, uh, to interact with things. So if you can imagine there's a semantic catalog, an application could do a query on the catalog the catalog would return a set of links. The links have content types. They have communication schemes in them, like HTTP, CoAP, MQTT. They describe a lot of what can be done, and the application can then filter those links, do queries on those links, and find the next level of detail, what kind of things are being exposed, sensors, actuators. Um, and that's how things can really be done independent of the protocol. So if I have an application that, that has an MQTT connector and a co-app connector, and I go to a co uh, catalog and discover some resources, they're going to have links, and some of them are co-app links, and some are MQTT links, and I can just connect whatever handler is appropriate to that particular scheme. So an application really only cares about the data. It doesn't really care if it gets it through HTTP or MQTT, it's just going to send a representation either way. So this is how the protocol agnostic uh, system can be built by using enough metadata to identify the protocol and just treat it as another hypermedia control. So that's what I mean by protocols use the data models and then, and then information models are really the, 
that you know this is the highest level. Okay, so layered resources, basically, I think I mentioned that a little bit too, that, that the resources kind of just uh, d describe themselves. Even if you have self-describing resources, there's still another layer of context that has to do with who owns it, who can use it, what's it for, what, what is it actually measuring, what's it connected to. And then yet another layer of bindings, we call application bindings. So when a light switch controls a light, that's, that's a binding, that switch is bound to the light. That, that happens when an application can discover enough about the resources to know what, what makes sense to, to connect. And those, I think, really all, all live in the, in the whole uh, space of what we call data models. So I wanted to talk a little bit also about protocols. And I didn't list all the protocols here by any means, but I wanted to show the, the three that I've been talking about, HTTP, CoAP, and MQTT, and how some of the difference, uh, what some of the differences are. And, you know, um, each has their own uses and their own advantages. Um, MQTT can handle a lot of streams, but it doesn't externalize any of the state of the endpoint. So if you want your application to know the state of the endpoint, you have to subscribe and listen for a while. But if you have a REST API, you can just go read the state. But sometimes if you want to know about a lot of data changes, you'd have to read the state each time. So you need some asynchronous notification. And the idea here is that all of these protocols, CoAP has its advantages. It's a, a REST API that's binary mapped. Um, it uses any IP protocol and has embedded discovery and asynchronous notification. And HTTP runs on the web. Um, it's, it's available. It's all kinds of libraries available for it. Um, it doesn't work very well on constrained networks. It's, it's, you know, it kind of needs a few hundred bytes <laughs> for a packet. So you're, you're going to be just playing at the web layer there. But that's, that's fine. And there are asynchronous notes. You can use put and a server hook for asynchronous notification and hook a handler and uh, web sockets and other kinds of long poles. So there are ways to do asynchronous notification as well. And then MQTT is an efficient binary message protocol that uses publish subscribe. So if I have public data sources or data sources with a lot of fan out and fan in, um, I can use MQTT and, and hook up the endpoints there. Can, can, uh, um, and I can map, importantly, make a topic pretty much map to a resource path. So I can, I can provide links that look the same whether they're using MQTT, HTTP, or CoAP. Okay. Protocol binding, I mentioned that a little bit, and it's an API hook so that a resource can be bound to an action. So updating a resource triggers an action. This is sort of how REST gets connected to message protocols through binding. Sometimes it's the whole server that's bound, and sometimes it's a resource by resource basis. Uh, an external action like an MQTT publish could update a REST resource. So you could have MQTT updates coming in, but your application software would just be doing gets and puts. You wouldn't have to have the MQTT endpoint. Uh, okay, so basically, there's no one architecture for all of IoT. The idea here is to break it down into design patterns and then build architectures back up that are more appropriate for particular use cases. I, I didn't really show even a fraction of the design patterns available. I just showed you know, my favorite ones. But basically what you get is you get to be able to create architectures that are tailored to solutions. You get to, at, at the same time, while reusing resources and reusing code, reusing protocols. You don't have to invent new protocols. And mainly I think it's just an easier way to think about well, all these standards are different. What do they do? Why would I want this one? Why would I want this other one? And if you look at the underlying design patterns, that's often good guidance as to why one protocol might be more uh, uh, appropriate than another. It's kind of breaking down what I call the silos of thought, where everyone, oh, I like this protocol. Everything it does is good. But, but when you really start breaking it down, you can say, well, yeah, it's, it's good at economizing use of the data link, and it's good at delivering data quickly, and you know, the, the design patterns matching against the use cases. So that was all I had to say, and any questions? Yes? A couple of questions. So one is about the data. So I feel like obviously these devices are super chatty, and so... Well, sometimes they are, but sometimes they just like to sleep like a bridge. The, 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 the strain gauges on a bridge aren't very chatty at all. But I mean, my point is that you see uh, design patterns of data bundling, filtering, or that kind of thing takes place, which is for your observation. 
The other one is looking for plumbing oriented, like in a very independent network with departmental things. Obviously, the health of things starts to matter. Right. How do you actually know what pathways are open? What can you reach? What can't you reach? And again, you know, what kind of patterns you see? Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah. And so um, the first, yeah, filtering is something that um, there are various protocols to do it, but definitely at the edge is the place to do that. So the idea of being able to run the device server at the edge and to have well-known patterns for how to do filtering, how do you represent rules, you know, how do you, um, uh, how do you put filters in somewhere, how do you maintain them, how do you know that this filter you put in three years ago is still need it. Are you going to have filter crud where, you know, filters are stuck out in these endpoints that you don't know about? So one of, the, one of the design patterns I like is this binding design pattern. A binding is an observable resource. So if you have a binding somewhere that says, this, here's a filter binding that's filtering an endpoint. With the REST API, you can go discover all of your bindings and you can find out what the filters are. And you can say, oh yeah, I, this filter was there three years ago for this one thing and I can remove it now, you know. So there, there's some design patterns around using REST APIs to, to create exposed bindings that can be managed and maintained. Um, in terms of, what was the second? The was about the health of the yeah, so the same thing. Um, we use Keep Alive messages and registration updates. So the soft endpoint is updated by periodic ping, but usually there's enough interaction with the device to, you know, it, that's all more of a timing regime. What's the maximum lifetime that I want to assume this device is still alive when I don't hear from it? And then how often am I going to send a, a refresh message? So we use UDP. So it doesn't have the TCP overhead, but it has this, this requirement. Yeah, yeah. A question over here, yeah. Um, I'm struck by how much it seems there's still a lot of reliance on, on kind of traditional internet patterns in terms of client server and centralization of certain functions rather than distributed functionality. And not, not a lot of really true peer-to-peer. -peer. And I was wondering if you could comment on kind of what's being done on trying to achieve that and, and, and how systems um, like these address fault tolerance. In other words, if, there's, if there are multiple single points of failure in these systems, they're obviously going to have some reliability. So there are, there are some single points of failure, but there are also ways of introducing redundant services and redundant uh, paths. So, for example, I might have the light switch and the light be paired devices that just send messages to each other and have no central point of... The very simple interactions can be set up with bindings. A smartphone doesn't really need any central server to interact with things, and so there are some good patterns for that. But they're... they're they're still not peer-to-peer -peer in, in some really pure way. They still have sort of a client-server style of interaction. Yeah, for peer-to-peer, for -peer, there are some systems that kind of are, are closer to, to that, that just send messages back and forth through objects. So look at AllJoin, for example. It, it's not really, it, it, it has services, but it's, you know, it's client-server, but it's much more sort of, it just sends messages back and forth, right? Because, for example, one obviously very key service is the, is the registry. Mm -hmm. Distributed registry is interesting too. Yeah, devices can have bits of registry in them. The, the resource directory server in uh, Intel's implementation of lightweight M2M has resource directory, so you could run it on a constrained device. Um, but I haven't seen anyone use it yet. And, and in fact, what, what you bring up is a very interesting point that we are currently in the process of working out the patterns for device-to-device -device interaction using these, these same protocols. So the server stuff has been well-defined because we had the Open Mobile Alliance had a stake in doing it and they created it to do device management and now we're using it for a, a middleware. But there hasn't been anyone to date that's worked out all of the profiles for how devices interact with each other using these APIs. All the protocols exist, the, the multicast, the uh, discovery protocols, and everything for interacting. Uh, but what's needed is for someone to specify exactly what, you know, write a big document with a bunch of shalls and <laughs> shall nots and stuff like that in it to, to actually specify how discovery is done, how initialization and onboarding is, all this stuff is different if you don't have a server, right? So I think it's a harder problem. Yeah. If you were to make a choice today, 
uh, which, would, which other protocols would you recommend for flexibility or future proofing? Because we make a choice to here and things evolve like the previous question. And the sensors can actually do something intelligently. What would you suggest? Um, well, I would, depending on the layer of the system, the three that I put up are the ones that I think are stable and are going to have some lifetime in the co-op, MQTT, and, and uh, HTTP. But at the same time, there are other specialized protocols that are not going to go away anytime soon, like DDS and what, and you know, um, <laughs> that have special uses. Um, and I didn't even mention XMPP at all because it's a whole system that can allow you to accomplish a lot of the same stuff using that protocol. And there are times when that's the way you would want to implement your system. I was trying to kind of focus on design patterns that are independent of protocols, but then at some point you have to realize your system by using protocols. And then that's where, that's where by understanding the, your use cases and design patterns, you can then look at the protocols and identify what that protocol brings, you know, to your, what value that brings, you know, like co-op has resource discovery built into it. But if that's not the way you want to do resource discovery, it doesn't really bring any, any value. You may want some other way of doing that through a centralized database that, or something like you might just want MQTT to move messages and use databases for all of your discovery it's in an enterprise situation, right? So. It, it, it really, it really, the answer is it depends, but there are plenty of stable protocols to choose from. Yeah? Is there a good resource to read more about design patterns in IoT? Um, hmm? I guess not. <laughs> I had a link page at the end, but it somehow disappeared. Um, there are a few, but I, I think it's really kind of, um, not a lot of people really thinking along these lines. I have a blog post, but I just pretty much got what I just said in the blog post. Um, yeah, good, good question. Yeah, question I should ask at the very first. Are your slides available online? Yeah, there's a slide share. Just, just go design patterns for IoT slide share, and I think you'll. I think I've got it linked already, but it's on my slide share. Great. I think uh, we have a break now. No more questions? Thank you.